Hello, I'm your host, Nate Shear, and welcome to the show. This is Mind Force, the podcast for love, life, and learning, where your mind matters. Today, we have Courtney Carini on ADHD and spreading the word through social media. Courtney, thanks for coming on the show, and I'll give you a chance to open with some comments and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I got started on social media probably three years ago, um, and it was just months after my own diagnosis at age 38. Um, so I've had ADHD my whole life, as everybody does who has ADHD. Um, but I didn't know it. Um, I had just been called, you know, lazy, spoiled, um, scatterbrained, airheaded, all the things that, you know, make you think it's a, a, a character flaw um, my whole life. And so I was never prompted to actually look into it um, until I was just struggling during COVID, um, trying to get work done on my computer. And I had a video game addiction at the time. It was on my phone, though. I have some mobile phone. Um, and I just could not do my work. And it was so important to me because I own the company. Like this was my own company. I have a walnut snack company called crazy go nuts. Um, and I couldn't get myself to do the things that I needed to do that were extremely important. You know, this is the, the, the life of my, my company. Um, and I just offhandedly said that to a friend and was like, oh man, I just can't, you know, I can't do these things and I just can't pull myself off of this game and I don't know what to do. And my friend just said, do you have ADHD? And I thought, wait, what is that? <laughs> is that the same thing as ADD or is that for kids? Is that like, isn't that like hyper little boys or is that the same thing? What What is that exactly? And it was funny how like, this is something that we hear about our whole lives. We, and we even just toss it around like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm so ADD, you know, but um, we don't actually know what it means and what it involves. And here I had gone 38 years, my whole life with severe ADHD, having no idea that that's what was plaguing me. Um, so I got on social media and at that point, um, so I have a long history in like musical theater and comedy writing. And so I've, I'm pretty well versed in making videos already and making comedy sketches and stuff. Um, so I got on social media and I started learning about ADHD, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and I started realizing that it pretty much makes up my entire personality. And so I started just making videos, funny videos, informational videos, sharing the stuff that I was learning. And this was when everybody was learning about ADHD on social media. And it just, my videos went really, really viral. Um, so it was really kind of a perfect storm. And then I start, people started asking me questions, expecting me to be an expert. And I thought, well, I want to know the answer to these questions. And I want to give good information. Um, so I may as well find out myself and, you know, get certified, get a formal education. So I actually enrolled in school and um, I'm about to graduate with my bachelor's in psychology and addictions. Um, my next step is to <clears throat> uh, apply for a PhD program in cognitive neuroscience. Um, because I would like to become a research neuropsychologist so that we can um, do some innovative research in these areas. Um, and then, I, of course, I became a certified ADHD coach. And this is all while owning a business and working it full time, <laughs> which is in true ADHD fashion of overloading your plate and overcommitting. Um, so the last three years really has been about that transition of um, becoming a full-time coach, which I am now uh, an, an influencer and a student, um, and working my way out of that company and into this work full-time because it's it's just so rewarding for me. It's it's like finding my long-lost family, my community. 
That's awesome. That's some good stuff. You're really doing a lot of different stuff. Sounds like a little bit of hyper focus. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, so you went 38 years and didn't really know what it was like, um, you know, exactly how you were uh, designed and things like that. So an example I've seen on social media quite a lot is the person that's colorblind and they, I guess they have the new glasses and they put on those, those glasses and all of a sudden they, they see the things they've never been able to see before. Was that kind of what that was like, that eye-opening moment at 38 years? I will say that getting on medication was. Um, and I actually have footage of my experience my first time on medica on effective medication because for some of us there is a very tangible like aha moment where suddenly your brain just like flips and you suddenly get to see what it's like to have a normal person's brain and i describe it at and it, it's very emotional for a lot of people for me I, I was crying it was it's a once in a lifetime experience um and and yes, it was very similar to the people who I've, I'm, by the way, I think I've watched every single one of those videos. I'm addicted to them. <laughs> it was very much like um, that experience of the, the people who are colorblind. Um, but I describe it as the world stopped spinning. Um, Cause that's what it felt like to me. There was this sudden stillness and almost like, and, and like a silence where, you know, when, when the first snow of the season happens and there's just this like eerie quiet and you just know that it's snowing just because of how quiet it is. Um, it's that stillness and just the awareness of just being super in the moment and very aware of your entire environment. Um, it's very hard to explain to somebody who hasn't had either experience, like either doesn't know what it's like to be neurotypical or doesn't know what it's like to have ADHD. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it was definitely a life changing experience for me. There was also though a bit of an identity crisis in it because I had built my identity around all of my hobbies and ideas and all my grand schemes and um, that, and I, I really had attached my purpose and identity to these things. And then in that stillness, I suddenly had the perspective to see how it was impossible to accomplish all of these things in one lifetime. And I had to start purging hobbies and commitments and responsibilities and ideas and goals if I wanted to actually be effective at anything. And so there was a lot of grief in that and a lot of um, confusion and a lot to sift through as far as like, I, I had to spend the next three years understanding who do I really want to be, what takes precedent, uh, and what's the actual journey to get there? And how do I clean up this 38-year mess in order to do that? Um, and I have to say, I'm super proud of the work that I've done in the last three years. I'm finally in a point where I'm really in the home stretch, like this room that I'm in. I'm, you can't see the whole thing, but it used to be a doom room, um, which is the term that us ADHDers call the room that we just put junk <laughs> <laughs> because it just piles up because we just always have hobbies and things. And then they, we lose, they run out of dopamine for us and we never pick them up again. Um, and so it was just piled high with just junk. Um, but now it's fully cleaned out and it's a office and a studio. And that's from, it's, it's reflective of all of the work that I've done in the past three years to kind of just go through that process step by step and sift through all of my stuff, purge everything that's not serving me um, and get a very clear idea of who I want to be and what I want to do and what the journey is getting there. That makes sense. I want to touch on something that you talked about. We throw around terms. We say, oh, you're so OCD when somebody wants, you know, something in order or you're so ADD because you forgot to grab something. Uh, so if there right. is people out there and listeners, you know, what's that tipping point or what's that advice you, you take from someone 
uh, being slightly scatterbrained to, you know, actually, you know, having the condition and, you know, not having people just kind of, you know, poke fun. What, what, what was that where it all came together? You said you started doing some research and when did it start to kind of, you know, come together for you? See, now I didn't even know that that stuff was ADHD until I got on TikTok. So the reason I sought out the diagnosis was for the, the dysfunction that I was seeing you know, right in front of me, which was I couldn't get my work done. I was addicted to video games. You know, I, I was, I would force myself to open my computer and start to do a task. And I would just sit there frozen, just not being able to do it because there was just this paralyzing anxiety around it. And I didn't understand what that was. Um, and then I just kind of looked at my patterns throughout my life. Um, you know, there's things about like internet addiction and all that kind of stuff. And I go, oh yeah, that was me. Um, and so I would recognize stuff like that when I was looking through the the diagnostic criteria and stuff. Um, but it really wasn't until TikTok that I understood all the traits around it. And like, especially the absent-mindedness. Um, I, in fact, I was just talking about this with my followers last night on my live session. It's so funny how nobody nobody tells you what normal is. So if you're, for instance, there's a lot of us who were just raised around people like us because it, it, it has a large genetic component. So most of us who have it have families full of it. Um, and we're attract, we're, we gravitate towards people who are towards other people who are neuro neurodivergent. So we kind of stick together and create neurodivergent families. <laughs> so, um, and then pick out friends who are also neurodivergent because, you know, we identify with them, we relate to them. So we, we make our own little um, echo chamber of neurodivergence and um, you don't realize that the outside world doesn't function like you and your friends and your family. Um, because, you know, everybody you see and interact with is just like you. And so you all just commiserate about like, oh yeah, I left my phone in the, every time I go to the public restroom, I leave my phone in the stall. Um, but nobody says what the normal standard is. And now that I'm medicated. How many times? <laughs> is it one time? Is it 10 times? You're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> can I tell you that I have, since I've been medicated, I've left my phone in a public restroom stall once in three years, <laughs> and I used to do it 100% of the time, every single time. Another thing was I would get in the car, and I could never just get in the car and go, I, oops, my keys, oops, my phone, got to go back. Oh, wait, did I lock the door? Yeah, I did lock the door. Go back. Wait, did I lock the door? Yeah, well, I did. I did. Oh, oh, but what about the, I wonder if Bender's okay, but you know, it, I couldn't ever just get in the car and go. And I, my boyfriend at the time would say things like, what is wrong with you? And I would just think to myself, what a jerk, you know, it's messed. <laughs> because it wasn't, it wasn't presented in a way that's like, Hey, Courtney, let's talk about this because this isn't normal. The normal cadence is. You know, hey, Courtney, did you know that most people that this happens to most people like once every, you know, X amount of weeks, um, not every single time. So and I and I had no idea because the, because we talk about these things as character traits, scatterbrained, lazy, um, airheaded, absent minded, um, because we talk about them as character traits. We have no idea that there could be a medical underlying. Like, I don't, I don't associate, like, there was a time where he said to me, I'm serious, you really should get checked out about this. And I'm thinking, checked out for what? A brain tumor? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I don't have dementia. I'm fine. I've always <laughs> been like this, you know? So we don't, um, that's the, I think the harm mostly is in talking about neurological problems as if they're character traits. And so if somebody is, when you, like you said, if somebody's a little scatterbrained, that kind of set an alarm off in my brain. Cause I'm thinking if some, if you're identifying someone as different because they're more scatterbrained than the people around them, 
that tells me that they're dealing with something. So, you know, I, I don't know. We could get down into the nitty gritty of like what the cadence is. But again, like, no, there is no standard cadence. Nobody says, hey, if you do this more than twice a week or if you do this, you know, there, there is no standard and no one comes knocking at your door. There's no doctors who come banging on your door saying, hey, do you have this symptom? Do you have that symptom? How often are you, do you lose your phone? How often are you looking for your keys? Nobody asks that. They just, we talk about it all as if we're like, I'm so silly, you know? And so um, we don't connect the dots there. Yeah. And I find it interesting too, because everything's a, a spectrum, everything's balance, you know? Right. And so I find it odd that with the certain conditions and whatnot, we want this like weird pass fail thing, you either have it or you don't. And maybe that's true to a certain extent, you know, if you're on one end or another, but there could be, you know, traits along the way that you have some of this and some of that. And so uh, not yeah. everyone's going to look exactly the same. I think in a lot of cases, for some reason, we want humans to be cookie cutter, which is kind of really ironic because we're all very complex and, you know, the opposite of cookie cutter. So there's no real way to make like the exact same human, but I do find it funny. And uh, I mentioned something, even though it's a slightly unrelated and maybe, you know, a little lighter, but on the radio, it's funny. They were talking about people that were growing up with certain food habits that they believed to be normal their whole lives. And so they listed a couple of them, like a ketchup sandwich that they thought a ketchup sandwich was normal. And then like, they went over to a friend's house when they were older and like, Hey, can I get a ketchup sandwich? And they're like, you, you just eat, you just eat ketchup like and bread. Like, yeah, that's it. Uh, but I think that goes to your point, even though it's like lighthearted, like if you're surrounded by it, you're not sure if that's normal or not. You, you ask for the ketchup right. sandwich and you think that's, I right. think that's normal. Just as, as kind of a final note, I, I do get, um, you know, as an influencer, who's not a licensed professional yet. Um, I do, I am very aware of like the misinformation narrative and, I do get the occasional troll and I got to say, I get very few trolls, but occasionally I'll have somebody who waves the big misinformation flag because, um, you know, because I'm not a licensed professional, I'm talking about things, uh, characteristics and such. And the, of course I'm having an ADHD moment where my, my brain's just wiped clean. It's like a little etch-a-sketch where you're, you're in the middle and someone just comes and shakes it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, what was I saying? Misinformation. Mm. Rolls. License. Oh, like I said, these professionals aren't knocking down our doors. They're not, no one, no one automatically screens you for these things. So the majority of us get diagnosed because somebody mentions it to us because a friend lets us in, you know, or the, so it's kind of my, I, I take it as my job to inform people of these things, to show them, hey, this isn't normal. Hey, this is part of, you know, this does mean that, you know, you should talk to somebody or, you know, you should at least know that this isn't the norm. Um, does that mean you have ADHD? I can't say that. You've got to go have an assessment, obviously. But it took for me, that friend after 38 years saying, do you have ADHD? And I had gone to multiple therapists and I told them about all my crazy ADHD habits, including buying a pallet of video games and trying to resell them, even though I didn't even have the console, you know, so I, and those, so those professionals keep failing us. So it's up to us to have to like clue people in. So it's tough. That is tough. If there was anybody out there listening, they were like, I don't want to go in. I don't want to, you know, be classified or pigeonholed or things like that. What would you say to someone that's, you know, afraid of taking that step, you know, after I you think all those classic years? classic imposter syndrome. And I think um, we all go through it. All of us do. Um, because, again, these things are presented to us as character traits. And so if we go into the doctor's office and say, you know, oh, I'm. I'm scatterbrained. That feels like he should just tell me to go home. <laughs> um, but and it has but a these negative connotation, things. right? Right. I think that's the the worst part. The negative. It's not like 
you know, neutral or positive thing when people say that. They're usually poking fun and things like that. So I think if it was a neutral term, that would probably be different. But usually those, those aren't used in positive ways. And I think the important thing for all of this really is to focus on the dysfunction. Because really, truly, in order for something to classify as a disorder, it has to cause dysfunction in your life. So what I tell people who come in, like I have, I do have some trolls who will come in and be like, stop making it feel like we're hopeless, helpless. And, um, you know, and ADHD is a disability. It's recognized under the ADA. And there are, I'm one of those people who is extremely relieved by that and is really helped by that because it makes so much more sense and helps me with my tools. But there are some people who it makes them feel broken or weak or less than or whatever. And my answer to that is always like, hey, if it's not causing dysfunction in your life, then you don't have a disorder. You're good, man. You know, keep living your life. I'm not going to try to convince somebody that they have ADHD and that they should go get checked out if they're living a cool, happy life and none of it's falling apart. You know, if they're not having um, a ton of distress every day because of it. Great. You do you. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that was kind of what you were getting at earlier when I asked the question previously. If you're moving through and work's going fine, relationships are fine and things like that, I think that's where you start to get to that tipping point where you're buying the pallet full of video games with no end in sight. And, you know, some of those things where it starts to unravel there a little bit. So, um, yeah. And, but... and, and if you're going to the doctor, like the the great way to to kind of tackle the imposter syndrome as well is to focus on the struggle because at the end of the day you went through all of this um research and you went down the rabbit hole to find out about ADHD you took the time to seek out a doctor and make that appointment and show up to that appointment um so you're clearly struggling with something you wouldn't go to all that trouble if you didn't actually if you if it wasn't plaguing you somehow so focus on what your struggle is and talk to the doctor about your struggle and allow the doctor to um, look at your struggles and see where they think it lines up. You know, don't go in insisting that you have ADHD because, you know, obviously you're not the expert and the diagnosis isn't up to you and you can't prescribe yourself meds. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to go to the doctor and you want to say, hey, I'm struggling with these things. And if your doctor is dismissive, and I got to say, there are a lot of problematic doctors out there who don't know what the heck they're doing. And I'm sorry for that. So please go seek it out a specialist if you can. But, um, but the main point here is to focus on, on the struggle when, when you're talking to your doctor and make sure that your struggles are addressed. So if you're having these struggles and your doctor's just like, and eh, you're just a woman, it must just be your hormones. Mm, okay, but my the other women aren't struggling with this. And okay, then let's look at my hormones. You know, what's the next step? How are we attacking my struggle? If it's not with an ADHD diagnosis? What is it? How are we gonna how are we gonna approach my struggles? That really should be the goal of that appointment, not in Oh, I'm I'm not successful unless I get an ADHD diagnosis. Well, you don't know that you have that. How about your goal is I, I won't rest until my struggles are acknowledged and addressed. That makes sense. And so now we've kind of outlined that foundation on, you know, if you may or may not and going down that. So let's jump into how the role of medication fits into that. How does that initially roll out when you are uh, diagnosed? Oh, man. Well, it varies greatly um, based on where you are, who you're seeing. Um, so. The most effective ADHD medications are controlled substances. They are the amphetamines, the uh, methylphenidate, uh, the stimulants. Now, they get a bad rap because there have been people who have developed addictions to them. Now, the studies have shown, and I have to, if I'm going to start talking about medication, I have to give the disclaimer of I'm not a licensed professional. I'm not a medical expert, please back up my information by, you know, doing your own Google Scholar search and talking to your doctor. Um, but I'm speaking from a place of, I go to all of the 
seminars and talk to the experts, pick their brains. I read a ton of studies every day um, just for fun and for school. Um, and I've been through my own medical uh, medications journey, and I've helped a lot of my clients through medications journeys. Um, so I do my homework. So that said, um, medications are really, really effective for ADHD and more so even, did I lose you? I'm going to keep going just in case. <laughs> ADHD medications are very, very effective more so than any other medication for disorders. Um, and I was watching a seminar given by Dr. Bill Dodson, who's very respected in the, in the industry, um, writes articles for Chad or Attitude Magazine. Um, I've even cited some of his work in my assignments. Should I keep going? <laughs> yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, so Dr. Dodson just gave a speech at this last ADHD conference. And he went through all the different medications and all the different kinds of treatment for ADHD. And um, what he found from the studies that he looked at was that therapies like talk therapy and all and symptoms, the only things that are effective for ADHD symptoms are proper medication and exercise. Hmm. Um, and ADHD coaching. It doesn't, it doesn't take away your symptoms, but what it'll do is it'll basically accommodate the world around you. So we, we construct the world around you to accommodate all of your um, idiosyncrasies of ADHD or of your disability, I should say. Um, so anyway, the medication can be extremely effective and it can absolutely change people's lives. My life has been a complete 180 from when I, before I was medicated. Um, so it's, it's really effective and it can even be very effective in preventing addictions. We are extremely prone to addiction because it's a do dopamine deficiency. And when you're low dopamine, you're craving, you're just craving anything with dopamine, food, drugs, money, gambling, sex, you name it. It's just that general craving that certain people interpret as a need for, you know, all those different things. So the, unfortunately these medications have gotten uh, a bad reputation and it's really just been because of the misuse of them. The really, the only people who are getting addicted to these medications are the ones who are um, using it recreationally when it was mm. prescribed, uh, crushing it up and snorting it. Um, you know, and so, so, and what happens there is their brain's getting flooded by dopamine. And that's a recipe for addiction because when you flood your brain with dopamine, your brain basically says, oh my gosh, there's, there's so much dopamine coming in. It's too much. Let's shut down some of these receptors. Uh, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So your brain downregulates some of these receptors. And then when you stop, when suddenly the dopamine's gone and you have less receptors, your brain panics and goes, oh my gosh, this is, this is not enough dopamine. And so, and that's the craving part. That's the, that's the addiction part where you're, you're feeling like there's a big deficit. So these medications though, that are effective are like extended release where, you know, they're, they're kind of dripping it to you throughout the day and they're lower doses. We're not talking about, you know, methamphetamine where it, it's these humongous doses. Um, I think he said something that that's like 200 times the strength of what my Adderall is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so this is like the, the medications that we're getting are these responsible chemicals that are actually designed to accommodate our inherent deficiency and even it out uh, so that we feel relaxed and normal and not craving all the time and aren't distracted with things like food or video games or whatever. Um, in fact, we're very prone to binge eating. Um, I, I had a binge eating disorder for many years. Um, 
because we're, we just have that craving and we're constantly trying to fulfill it. And that's very, it can be very distracting, you know, when you're trying to work. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. On top of that, your brain is prioritizing anything that has dopamine over the stuff that doesn't. So that's what causes that paralyzation of, I can't make this phone call. I can't, I can't make this appointment. I can't clean my room. I can't brush my teeth. I can't shower. You know, we, a lot of us suffer from basic, um, basic hygiene. Can't even get ourselves to do that, but we can do these brilliant things like build a business from zero to multi-million dollar company, you know, but we struggle with, you know, brushing our teeth and getting to the <laughs> dentist. So, um, but that's because our brain is prioritizing the stuff with dopamine and it's riding that train and it paralyzes you when it comes to something that doesn't give you dopamine. So these medications are helping that, helping us even that out and are keeping us from seeking out those dopamine sources like drugs. So, um, when you go to these conferences, the international ADHD conference, and you go to the seminars by experts. Um, and we're talking about Bill Dotson, who has been treating ADHD for 25, 30 years or something, is doing research in the field on rejection sensitive dysphoria. He's really well respected in the in the industry. And um they're all ever they're all perfectly aligned in saying that these medications do far more good than bad. And depriving someone of of their medication is like depriving a paralyzed person of their wheelchair. Um, it's, it's really detrimental and it stunts people and it completely affects their lives. Um, and for me, even a big component of it is emotional stability. He, Dr. Dodson talks about medication as being, um, I think he called it emotional armor. And I think that's perfect. That's absolutely what it does for me. Instead of crying every time a sad song comes on the radio or crying anytime I'm frustrated, stressed out, angry, you know, any feeling at all. Um, I actually have control over my emotions now. Now I only cry if something is really sad or, you know, hurtful. Um, so these things can really cause a ton of dysfunction in our lives. And so depriving us of them is really, can really, really be detrimental and can absolutely be a matter of life and death, especially since ADHDers have a much smaller life expectancy. I think it's something like 15 years less. Um, mm. And it's because of all these reasons. There's all this dysfunction that can cause a ton of low self-esteem, depression. Um, so we can take our own lives because of that, just because of the despair around all the dysfunction. But it's also, um, you know, we get addicted to drugs. We also are adrenaline seekers. So we take risks all the time. We're also impulsive. So there's STDs and stuff. So there's all these components that put us at risk constantly when these medications could be helping us. So we're working against um, the laws. They're controlled substance. And we're working against stigma. Because they don't, it doesn't really line up when you look at the, the research. It's, it's not the level of fear around prescribing these medications is highly unfounded when you look at the actual statistics. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, there are non-stimulants that can be effective for people. Um, they're not statistically, they're not the most effective. And I could get into the neuroscience of why, um, but really just to try to boil it down um, into base oversimplified terms. Um, none of the non stimulants just like target dopamine. It, and dopamine is really the big problem. There's also norepinephrine, which is a problem. Um, if you're really high norepinephrine, it can make you really on edge and easily distracted by stimuli, but that's not usually the biggest contributor to ADHD. It's usually the, the dopamine deficiency. And these non-stimulants tend to not tackle the dopamine problem. Um, my doctor put me on 
Wellbutrin originally um, to start with. It's not a stimulant, but it works on dopamine, but it's actually an antidepressant. Mm-hmm. Um, and it didn't work. And I, I hear a lot of uh, my followers say that they had to try Wellbutrin first. Um, and a lot of these doctors, you know, they want to, they want to be safe and they want to take the extra precautions. Um, especially I'm with Kaiser and Kaiser, you know, is everything in house. And so they have these in-house policies. So, um, I have to get drug tested and stuff if I'm going to be on Adderall and they have to try all these non-stimulants first to make sure that those aren't good options. Um, so we end up having to go through these long journeys with our doctors trying to prove that we're not drug seekers. Um, we have to go through the non-stimulants. Um, we have to get our heart looked at to make sure that there won't be any heart problems on the stimulants. But again, the, the numbers don't actually show that the heart thing is a problem. It's really, it's, it's, um, it's not actually an issue, but, um, anyway, I digress. The, the whole medication journey is really long and arduous and a lot of people give up right away. And it's not necessarily their fault either that a lot of the doctors don't know what they're doing because they're not familiar with all of the medications that are available. They're not familiar with how to uh, properly dose people, um, how to properly titrate. They're not, um, they're not informed on how to combine different medications to get the optimal effect or to combat negative side effects. So people get on a stimulant, they don't like the side effects and they go, Oh, I can't handle this. Forget it. And they just don't, don't ever call their doctor again. And they give up when in reality, there's all these other medications. There's things that we can try to mitigate these side effects. If you talk to your doctor about it, some of those side effects actually go away over time. Um, you can start at a low dose until the side effects go away and then you can move up. Like there's just so many options and not even all the doctors are aware of all those options and not, and the doctors don't do the, their due diligence in following up with their patient to make sure that, um, that these medications are being effective and that they're, um, they're having more benefit, uh, than, than struggle. Um, so, you know, I I would say that my advice to anybody who wants to go down the the medication road, um, and you know, I, I'm very pro medication because I've seen what it can do. And I realize that it's a very personal issue and I would never push medication on somebody who just like is morally against it. It's against their values or And, you know, there's some people who can't be on medication for whatever reason they have health problems or whatever. Um, So I would never push it on somebody who really is against it. But for anybody who's scared or skeptical or just has hesitations, um, really, I would encourage you to go out and really just do the research, like figure out for yourself what's available, how it works, and then talk to your doctor and be in constant communication with your doctor about how you're feeling, what's next, um, you know, make sure that they're, that they're up to date on all of the latest medications, because there's still new ones coming out. Um, so I really think that it, it, it's an uphill battle right now in regard to education. We really need to educate everybody about these medications, how effective they are, why, what's available. Um, and that includes the doctors and includes the patients too, because the patients, if you only think that there's one medication for this and one dosage and it didn't work, you're just not going to call your doctor again, but they need to know that this is a process and there's going to be a lot of trial and error, but we'll get there. And unfortunately there are some people who have these, um, genetic predisposition predispositions that makes them that make them very resistant to certain medications um like i have a client right now who's tried every stimulant under the sun and she's on like the maximum dosages and she feels awful because she keeps going to the doctors and the doctors are looking at her like she's a drug seeker but she's like no i did the genetic testing i'm showing you my body's resistant and 
all of our bodies are so different. Like we process these medications in so many different ways. Like they go through so many different parts of our body, our liver, you know, there's so many places where the medication could, you know, oh, we don't have the right metabolite or we don't have the right, you know, enzyme to, to process it properly uh, for whatever reason. And every person is so vastly different from the next. Um, We end up talking about these medications, like, it's one size fits all. And it is really the opposite. It's really very, very tailored to each person. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm glad you were able to cover the medications and then also some of those alternative therapies trying to work through. But it sounds like the main thing is really just trying to stick with it for a while because it could take some time. The next thing I wanted to get into uh, myself, I'm active duty military. And so I'm curious, uh, the next topic I want to get into is stigma. Um, There's stigma in the civilian sector, and then there's, you know, even more of a a stigma in certain professions and things like that. Um, So with specific professions or career fields and things like that, do you have any advice for, you know, kind of breaking through the stigma? Sure. So it's a, it's a little difficult when we're dealing with occupations because much like relationships, if you're diagnosed late, you have already gotten yourself into that relationship or job and you didn't necessarily vet it uh, when you got into it for being conducive to your disability. So what I find is that a lot of people who are late diagnosed will suddenly look at the people around them and there will be people there's there will be people and I and I kind of put them in two different categories of there'll be people who don't understand and there will be people who don't want to understand mm-hmm. and one of those I'll give you one guess is toxic <laughs> um so you know, and I, and I've been definitely exposed to both. So, um, the, the person who doesn't understand, um, is the person who asks questions or says something like, um, doesn't everyone do that? But then when you say, Hey, you know, this is actually my ADHD or you, you explain your inner struggle, they listen and they take your word for it. And they give you the benefit of the doubt. And um, I think that's the difference is that the people who don't want to get it impose their own view- <laughs> impose their own views on you and insist that they're right. And no matter what you say your experience is, they insist that they're right. And that's just an attitude that is toxic. And it is not, it's, it's a non-starter. And it's, it's not a healthy environment for people with ADHD. So what I tell everyone is that you're in control of your own narrative. And there's kind of two, two general um, mindsets of ADHDers. One is somebody who doesn't want to seem broken, doesn't want to seem less than. Usually it's the person who was diagnosed young and was called a bunch of slurs and was treated like they were stupid and it was maybe put in special ed when they felt like it wasn't right for them, you know, and was was um, looked down upon because of it their whole life. That person usually doesn't want people to know that they have it and um, doesn't want pity about it, doesn't want to be called a disability. Um, and then the other side is people who tend to be in my position, which is struggled, struggled, struggled for so long. And we're told that we had a bad attitude. We're spoiled. We're lazy, blah, blah, blah. And just thought, how could I be all these things? I'm trying so hard. I'm doing all the right things, I think. And I, I'm still, you know, I'm still, it's still not working. And finally we find out that we have a disability and it's like, oh my gosh, finally somebody gets it. See, I am struggling. I am exhausted every day for this reason. Um, And so for the people who don't want to seem broken, then you don't have to tell anyone. You don't have to tell anyone. 
Or what you can do is you can talk to your employer, talk to your work environment, talk to your, the people in your life about all the positive things about it. Yeah, I have ADHD, but I've managed the, um, the symptoms by, you know, creating systems for myself, maybe being on medication. And it makes me very creative and I'm an outside the box thinker. And I have this insatiable curiosity that makes me a great problem solver, you know, so you can really be positive forward with it. Or if you're someone like me who, you know, people didn't think there was anything wrong with you because you didn't, you know, wear that badge on your arm this whole time. Um, you can say things like, you know, it does, I know that I, I look like I have my stuff together, but, um, there are some very invisible struggles that I deal with. And, um, I would really appreciate some understanding if, you know, when, this, when, you know, XYZ happens, or I would really love if we could do something in a way that helps me, you know, XYZ, you can ask for accommodations to help you that, that work with you. Um, and that's part of my coaching too, is figuring out how your brain works, like what it actually responds to. And it's going to look unconventional to an outsider. It's going to look weird. Um, you're going to have unconventional methods of doing things, but if you're actually allowed to do those, if you're actually allowed to do things the way that your brain wants to, you can be more productive. You can, you can make progress. And so as long as those methods aren't disrupting anything or causing harm anywhere, why wouldn't your employer want you to use those methods? If it means you're going to be more productive, it's, if it means you're actually going to meet the deadline, you know, whatever you need, yeah, let's do it. Who cares if it's out of the norm? You know, if it's not hurting anyone, go for it. Um, but you know your employer better than I do. <laughs> Everybody has a different <laughs> employer. Uh, and everybody has a different partner um, and and family life. So uh, you really, it's really just about navigating those different personalities. But my biggest piece of advice would be you are in control of your life. And that includes who you surround yourself with. And I've been in situations that felt completely trapped and impossible to get out of financially dependent on somebody, um, living with them, you know, it, having pets together or whatever. Um, but I'm here to tell you that you can, you can choose who you can be around. You can leave that job. Um, yes, it, it, it can feel devastating. It can feel like a nuclear bomb at the time because it's a huge major change. But if you are doing it in a way that puts your sights towards surrounding yourself with people who are healthy for you, who acknowledge who you are, love it, um, value you for all of your um, positive attributes, um, va value the things that come out of your mouth, you know, trust you um, and want to work with you regardless of what your needs are. It's very, very, very worth it in the end. Um, and as long as you're in those toxic environments, it's going to feel like a major struggle bus. But the minute you're ever put into an environment that's totally healthy of people who get you, it's absolutely life changing and you can completely see the contrast. It's like, I, I can't explain it. It's like arriving in heaven. <laughs> where everyone just automatically like gives you the benefit of the doubt and understands all your quirks and you don't have to apologize for anything because they just get it, you know, um, it's magical. So yes, I, it's, it's hard. To, it, it feels a little, a little ableist and elitist to say, you know, get yourself out of the toxic environment. But, um, you know, I, I know how difficult it is. I've been there. And I can tell you that I, and I avoided it for years because of that. And I would even tell my therapist, you know, it's better for me to endure the, the pain right now because, you know, in the long run, it's definitely worth the nuclear bomb. <laughs> take that out of context. <laughs> that's not a good yeah. sound bite. Um, well, that's good stuff. I'm glad you came out and uh, sat with us for a little bit. Little bit. It was a good time. Uh, I thank you for taking some time. Uh, it's kind of crazy uh, out here in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, I travel 
too much. No. I'm tired. Um, but uh, I'm glad you could come out and uh, share some really good advice. I can't wait to piece this all together and get some, uh, you know, better sound bites than the nuclear bomb. But yeah, thank you for coming out, Courtney. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, uh, I encourage all the listeners to let me know what their thoughts were on this episode or any others. Uh, the audio is on Buzzsprout and then the video is on YouTube. Uh, I love you all. See you.